creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, alleluia. The burning sun with golden beam, the silver moon with softer gleam. Praise Him. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along, oh, praise him, alleluia. Thou rising morn in praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find a voice, Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Let all things there create a bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him, alleluia. Praise, praise the Father and the Son and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Alleluia. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise him, oh, praise him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Good morning. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church for this service on Sunday, October 11th, 2020. This is the Reverend Portia Iverson. The opening prayer, bless us, O God, with a reverence sense of your presence, that we may be at peace 
and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The call to worship. The Lord is king. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Moses and Aaron were among his priests who called upon his name. They cried to the Lord and he answered them. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Let us worship God. The prayer of confession. Merciful and gracious God, restless are our hearts until they rest in thee. So draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we may be wholly yours. Write your blessed name, O Lord, upon our hearts there to remain so that nothing shall ever move us from your love and lead us through the temptations and dangers of this life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Take heart, Christ is with us in the spirit. Do not be afraid, go where he calls you. Have faith that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. O God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you, and with the church through all ages, we thank you for your saving love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first reading this morning from the Old Testament is from the book of Exodus, the 33rd chapter, Moses' intercession and God's promise of his presence. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I might find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, Please show me your glory. Then the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, God said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And he said further, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on this rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand when I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The word of the Lord prays to you, Lord Christ. And our New Testament lesson this day is from Thessalonians, the first chapter, 
verses 1 through 7. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. A word of God on the Thessalonians' faith and their example. May this, these readings be blessed to us for our understanding. Let us pray. O oh God, do you did send your word to speak to the prophets and to live in your Son. Prepare us that we may now receive blessings from your hand that may lead us to life anew. Amen. A poet was to write, There is something in the autumn that is native to my blood. Something's coming. Do you sense it? Do you too feel it in your blood? Fall schedules are in place, even in the midst of the pandemic. The crops are about to be harvested. And the landscape has taken on an autumn hue. The wild grasses blow, wave, ripple, and dip in the breeze like a floating sea. Autumn is here. The trees are turning to yellow and red. The crystal clear night air takes on a nippiness. The stars seem to burn brighter in the October sky. Harvesters will still be at work in the night. Headlights beaming as the combines, like phantoms in the darkness, crisscross the fields, moving up and down the rows of corn and beans. Winds whip across the plains, heralding the change of season. The air is humming and something great is coming. Who knows? Something's coming. Something's good. Who knows what it is, but it is going to be great. Do you remember those words from the song West Side Story, the play and the film? Although we are still in the season of the year that the church calls common time or ordinary time, these Sundays can also be called Sundays of Pentecost. Pentecost suggests that there is something extraordinary and creative about the moment in which we stand now. We're on an approach to a new season. And the Hebrew people had that same feeling this time of year as they prepared for their great fall festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. It came at the time of the autumn equinox in late September or early October. And then the Hebrew people would pause to enjoy their great fall festival celebrating the creation of the world and celebrating God as ruler over the universe and king. Something's coming. The changing of the seasons points us also toward the rapid approach of the season of Advent, the coming of Christ. In just a matter of weeks, that will become our focus. But for this moment, the turning leaves, the changing of the season, lead us to a new awareness, a clarity of vision, like the slap of wind in our faces 
creates a sense of urgency and a need to know. We desire to know about life. We have a longing, a need to understand who we are and where we are going. It's where we catch Moses in scripture this morning at that experience of heightened awareness from Exodus that we read. For Moses is in between times. He is in between the seasons of his own life. Moses has successfully pleaded with the Lord to forgive the people and to not kill them for the golden calf fiasco. And now Moses wants a full restoration of the covenant relationship with his chosen people, sensing perhaps a softening of God's divine wrath Moses implores the Lord, you have said to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. If God, the Holy One, will not go before them, leading them in the way as before, who will go? If Yahweh will not be in their midst, who will be? Show me your ways, Moses implores God, that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Moses experiences that heightened awareness, the urgency that the poet was to describe when he wrote, Take me often from the tumult of things into thy presence. There show me what I am and what thou hast proposed me to be. Then hide me from my tears. Moses longs for the special presence of Yahweh in his life. Give me a heart to find out thee, and read thee everywhere is his prayer. Show me your way that I may know you. Knowing God. It's a theme throughout scripture. The prophet Isaiah was to write, Thus says the Lord God, all flesh shall know that I am the Lord your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Or the psalmist in the 40th Psalm was to write, Be still and know that I am God. For this is a cry, a longing. It's our cry, but it's as old as the ages, a desire of the heart to know God. The great Augustine was to express it best when he was to write, Restless are our hearts until they rest in thee, until we know thee fully. And for the prophet Jeremiah, he was to write, as the word of the Lord came to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. So we ask this day how we long to know the one who knows us so well. Can we know God at all? I suspect, whether you know it or not, that that may be the reason that many of you come here on a Sunday. And we hope to be back together in worship here in this place next Sunday. But whether you come here in person or whether you come from our recorded services, we come desiring to get a better, deeper sense of God and to know and experience God's presence in our lives, to be sure of it. Surely in this time, we know we need more than ever to know that God is with us. The Presbyterian minister Frederick Buechner was to write, knowing something or somebody isn't the same as knowing about them. More than just information is involved. The knower doesn't simply add to his mental store and go his own way to know is to participate in, to be affected by. When you really know a person or a language or a job, the knowledge becomes a part of who you are. It goes with you. It gets into the bloodstream. The writer Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in her beautiful poem, was to write, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. 
I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely. I love thee purely. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood faith. I love with the breath, the smiles, the tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall love thee better after death. Her poem is a litany about loving and knowing and about the many ways she knows the one she loves. Show me your way, Moses entreats the Lord this day, that I may know you and I may find favor in your sight. Well, what are the ways that we do know God? We know God through scripture and through sacrament. It was through scripture that the risen Christ opened the eyes of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And God still speaks to us through scripture. And that is why preaching of the word is so important in Presbyterian and Protestant churches and why we in the Presbyterian Church at the time we were ordained are ordained to be ministers of the word and sacrament, word and sacrament. And it is through sacrament, through the familiar words of the communion service that we are reminded of another way we know God. For we remember at that time when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. We know God also as Holy Spirit, who speaks to us in our hearts and minds, even on the house to the car that we have made a thousand times before. And we know God through and with others in the community of faith. The Midwestern Writer Edgar Lee Masters, in his classic Spoon River Anthology, was to have the character Faith Matheny express it like this. At first you will not know what they mean, and you may never know, and we may never tell you. Those sudden flashes in your soul like Lambert lightning on snowy clouds at midnight when the moon is full. They come in solitude, or perhaps you sit with your friend, and all at once a silence falls on speech, and his eyes without a flicker glow at you. You two have seen the secret together. He sees it in you and you in him, and there you sit, thrilling, lest the mystery stand before you and strike you dead with a splendor like the sun. Be brave, all souls who have such visions. You're catching a little whiff of the ether reserved for God himself. We meet Moses this day as he seeks to know God. And God offers Moses a whiff of the ether. For Moses is allowed to see God pass in glory. It's a moment of mystery and danger, but intimate and distant at the same time. God says, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. Here, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Moses is permitted to see a God that is real, as real as can be with a face and a hand and a back. It's what we call anthropomorphic, that kind of language, a description of God that contains human physical features. But human language reaches its limit when attempting to describe God or even capture the experience of an encounter with the one who is both radically other 
and imminently present, who in the words of the Scots Confession is omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, infinite, incomprehensible. Even Moses, who communicates more directly with God than any other Old Testament figure, is only allowed to catch a fleeting glimpse of God's back, a glimpse of God, a whiff of the ether reserved for God. The psalm writer was to say, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, I cannot attain to it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us also. As real as is the God whom we know in scripture and sacrament in the days of our lives and in our life together here, as real as the God we meet in the storm and the wave, the sea and the sun, in the blustering wind that crisscrosses our prairie, we cannot fully know our God in this life. But we can rest in the confidence that God knows us fully. I know you by name, God says to Moses, and he promises him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. No one knows us as intimately and completely as God. And what Moses experiences will become the heart of the Christian message. I know you by name. You are counted as a child of God. You are accepted, regarded by God as an object of inestimable value. Not from your actions or from your inactions, but rather we stake our claim and celebrate our joy because of the mysterious and gracious act of God that God longs to be in relationship with us. How do you know God? How do you know God knows you by name? How have you known God's presence? Have you experienced answered prayer, recovery from illness, protection from a loved one, guidance offered through another Christian, or even a stranger serving in his name? Were you led or saved or spared? Did you discover that God never gave up on you? Did God show you the way? What revelation of God's nearness and knowing have you experienced? This day we celebrate God's grace with us, the grace we joy in every day of our lives throughout the changing seasons. It is the grace that extends across the centuries from the days of Moses to the deliverance of his people, the grace we see reflected in the life of the Thessalonian church, an example to all believers, where the word of God was received with joy. It is grace shining through the years, before we even knew it. In a far distant twinkling star, in the night pointing toward Bethlehem that we celebrate, it is grace, the air which we breathe and live and upon, grace that surrounds our every day. And so we say, for all God's goodness to us, we give God our thanks and praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you reveal yourself to the humble and contrite heart. Grant unto us who seek your face such a clear vision of you that we may rest quietly in your presence. O oh Lord, the light of the world, the desire of nations, the shepherd of the sheep, look upon us with compassion. Enlighten our minds with truth. Satisfy our hearts with your love 
and feed our souls with your spirit. Grant that we and all those for whom we pray may know you as the spring of all comfort, the source of all joy, and the fountain of all blessings. Today we especially pray for peace among all peoples, our nation and its leaders, that we may be a more perfect union. We pray for all who suffer illness and loss, especially due to the pandemic, for those who have suffered loss of home from the fires on the West Coast and who suffer unemployment and hunger. We pray for congregations that work worship with us in this space, City Lights Mosaic and the Anglican Church. We pray for a safe heart harvest. O God, perfect in us your love, that we may conquer all selfishness and hatred of others. Fill our hearts with your joy and the peace which passes all understanding. And now in confidence we make this in all our prayers in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us when we are together to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love and all God's people everywhere, all across the world, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. <laughs>